This is your host, Zay Smallman, and you're listening to episode 12 of I Guess We'll Do It That Way. This is part two of our conversation about locations, and I also reveal which nude dude celeb I saw. I Guess We'll Do It That Way is presented by Mama Bear Studios. Mama Bear's mission is to create entertaining works of art that explore our humanity. If you like the show, don't forget to subscribe and rate us on iTunes. Okay, here's episode 12. Hey, we're okay, back. Cool. What's up? <laughs> and we're back. Um, and we're back. Dude, I kind of would love radio. Like having a producer, doing it live with callers. and I mean, before, that would be kind of fun, right? Before we decided, when you called me and asked me to do the show, and I yeah. said yes to you, I spent the next the evening after I said yes, looking at Opie and Anthony videos. I think I told you this. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, You didn't. You know Opie and Anthony? They're sort of like Howard Stern type talk radio. Not talk. What's the word? Yeah. They're like shock jocks, basically. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. And they used to be in New York on Sirius um, satellite radio, and they were famous for doing sort of outlandish pranks and stunts and usually pretty profane. Like that? Bingo. And they famously, they got into trouble all the time because, yeah, for whatever reason. But they also very publicly got into a feud, the two guys, Opie and Anthony. They worked together for tens of years, decades together. And they eventually split up pretty unamicably. Mm. And it's kind of interesting to go through and watch them because they're on other shows talking about each other talking shit about each other it's crazy and they eventually got together and reconciled because they each started competing shows Hmm. and ultimately some of their friends got them together and they reconciled or whatever but i'm just counting down the days until you and i have a huge fight and never (gasps) talk again john don't we're never gonna have a fight john yeah we'll see it depends who this i'll just uh, murder you before he ever gets (laughs) last time we talked see this is what it all hinges on though last time we talked You told me and Hmm. the listening audience. Tell us. That you saw Peter Dinklage's wiener. John, I never said that, though. No? (laughs) That's exactly how I remember it. You told me you were going to talk about. John, that was days ago for our audience, but (laughs) let's not pretend. That was 10 minutes ago for us. And you said that. You put words in my mouth. That's true. I did. John, are you trying to sabotage this show? Are you trying to cause the fight that's going to lead to the breakup of this co-hosting partnership? Whatever, man. So, uh, who's dingling? Did you see? Well, so this is part two. We'll we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. We're still talking about locations, John. We got a lot to cover. All right, all right. We'll get there. But welcome back. Um, this is part two, and uh, yeah, we're excited to have you. So you know, maybe one of the most famous uh, location shots, at least in my personal uh, movie viewing mm-hmm. history, is the opening scene. I think it's the opening scene from the movie Vanilla Sky. Mm. What a pain in the ass that must have been to shut. Remind down. me of what it. Remind me of it. It's Tom Cruise, of handsome. Wait, handsome we, have devil. we ever talked about a movie that doesn't star Tom Cruise? I think we're on a pretty serious hot streak right now. No, did we talk about Hereditary the last time we talked? Because Very it turns briefly. out, you know, the little girl. She that actually that part was played by Tom Cruise. <laughs> That guy is a serious actor. Um, but, dude, they, in the very beginning of that movie, they he drives out into Times Square in his mm. fancy little Porsche, and it's completely empty. I mean, he drives into Times Square, and wow. it's there's not one person in it, you know, and it's a dream or imagine. possibly a dream. But they shut down. They actually filmed it in Central uh, – in Times Square, and they shut the <sighs> entire thing down for, like, a couple hours, you know? I just can't even imagine – it's crazy, dude. It's All those businesses. I mean, how much do you have to pay McDonald's in Times Square to shut down for two hours? And then there's yeah. 45 other businesses. Kind of interesting Yowza. because that and shot. And the cops you would need. Oof. Oh, it must have cost a fortune. I'm curious. To, we should look it up. But I'll call that, Cameron and find out. Call him. Um, that, um, it's kind of funny because they actually turned that part of Times Square. Obviously, it's heavily populated, but. You used to, before 9-11, you could drive into the middle of Times Square, like right down that main street, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And can they you blocked not anymore? It, they've blocked them off now. They're like off You can still drive through you can parts get of it, through. Though. Yeah, you can definitely get through parts of it. But the main, like, middle mm-hmm. section where, like, TKTS is, that, you could used to be able to drive through there. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 right, right. And now you can't. It's pedestrian. I think they what did a, that. That would have been down. such a nightmare. Uh, 
yeah, but that scene is really cool. You should go back and watch that. That movie okay. is very, very good. It's a very good movie. Soundtrack, um, one, of the, one of the finest soundtracks, too. Anyway, that location, that must have been crazy. I can't even imagine. I, I really, I, I really can't even. We'll fathom. put a clip. We'll put a clip somewhere. So it's it's been interesting trying to figure that out. I, you know, part of what I'm doing is I'm talking to people who have been here longer or in different scenes. You know, I'm talking to my friend uh, Brandon, who he's a concert promoter. He actually has a really cool company called Sit the Cat, and basically, you know, he's a concert promoter. He like works with bands to try to get shows booked and fill them up. And uh, you know, so I'm talking to him, I'm talking to a couple other people, and. You know, just kind of saying, you know, what places am I not thinking of? And for instance, Brandon would immediately, he was like, oh, well, you should look at the American Legion's lodges, you know, mm-hmm. or halls, you right. know, because I guess, oh, what is the American Legion? Do you even know? I'm not even sure. It's some like military. It's like a VFW. Yeah, gotcha. But they have all these buildings and some of them, you know, a lot of times they run them out as concert halls or, or for weddings or whatever. And some of them are really, really cool and old, right. um, you know, so that, you know, and even uh, this one venue that I was talking about was an old Masonic Temple Lodge. Um, you know, there's a lot of places like that that I'm looking at. And, yeah, I'm talking to different people and, and, and trying to look at different cool places because in my mind, you know, you were asking last time about, you know, how to visualize rollers, the place. And in my mind, it's actually I have certain very sort of firm non-negotiables about what rollers is. You know, it's it's got to be certain things but not many of those non-negotiables are like it has to be it has to hold exactly this many people you know or it has to have this kind of ceiling you know for me it's much more it has to feel like a pair of jeans that you've been wearing for like four years you know it can't it has to it has to be loved and sort of lived in and granted it can't be too big and it can't be too small and there's certain things, but for the most part, it's kind of just a vibe thing. You know, you walk into a place and you're like, yeah, there's history here. And then you walk into other places and you're like, this feels like, uh, you know, this feels like an IBM office just without the desks, you know, like you just got to find, you got to go off of vibe a lot of times. Um, and, and part of what I'm running into with this one venue that I really like is, and these are the kinds of things, you know, that, that make sort of the whole thing, this big puzzle is, you know, I talk to the owner and I, I, I sort of tried to get in touch with them like six different ways. Couldn't figure anything out. Then I was having dinner with a good friend of mine who used to live upstairs. And she was like, oh, yeah, I know the owner of this. No, I'm sorry. It didn't even come up that way. She just said she mentioned that she wanted to take us to this one venue. And she's like, and I think I could, you know, I probably get this in for free because I, I like I went to college with the guy who owns it. And like, you know, he's really great. He loves having people. And I was like, wait, seriously, you know, like that's the place that you just happen to know the owner of. And so that was like one of those things where I was like, I couldn't get in touch with him for like two weeks, you know, just searching everywhere for contact. And then, of course, it turns out that I already kind of have this weird backdoor connection. But the problem is. So much of intention is kind of just that's like the first half because I, I, you know, I have lunch with the owner. We talk. He loves the idea for the movie. He loves the idea of us shooting it there. But the reality is I don't know what their February looks like and Mm. neither does he, you know, and so he can say like right now when we talked, you know, this was probably a month ago. They've got quite a few openings, you know, like there's a decent chance that we can kind of work around their schedule and. Um, but the problem is, you know, they, uh, they'll, they'll charge 20 grand oh, to have no. a commercial come in for a day. Not me, you know, right. cause he's, he's basically saying like, Hey, like you, yeah, we'll do it basically for free. Whoa. But the problem is if, you know, I'm running a business, if some commercial wants to come in and they need the set in three days and they're offering me 25 grand to shut down, like. I kind of can't say no to that and I can't blame him for not saying no to that. So it becomes this thing where, you know, you're asking for favors. Will you guys sign a contract? No, we don't have a contract because I don't even have dates yet, you know? Right. um, And I can't really expect him to sign a contract that gives me an exclusive on the space. For instance, you know, recently they had, now everybody's going to figure out what this place is. Not that it really matters. I just, it, it's no point in going into too much detail. But, yeah, you know, give recently, us some details like, so I can Google this while you're talking. Well, recently, yeah, like, Dave Chappelle, recently Dave Chappelle came to town okay. and did two nights yeah. at their place with, like, right. less than a week of notice. And granted, that doesn't happen every week. That may not happen in February, but it might. 
and I'm sure as hell not going to tell Dave Chappelle that he can't come and record, you know. So, um, it, you know, you just end up in situations like that. So that's why I'm trying to sort of broaden my horizons and have lots of backup plans. And um, and there are different ways that we can potentially do it. You know, there's a version where there is a – and, of course, I will never tell people if this is how it works. No, that's not true. I will. Um, it, would, it would ruin a little bit of the magic, but in some ways there's – there's a version of shooting this movie where we have a stage location and then we have a back behind the scenes location. Right. You know, and then we have an alley location and all of those are different places. And sure. we basically would take the schedule and lump them all together in those places and make it feel like one big location. But in reality, it's all separate places. That's a very common tactic. Um, you know, for instance, in Seinfeld, you know, the, all those exterior shots, well, not the ones where they're walking, you know, most of that's, but like the shots of the apartment building, the shots of the cafe, those are all real exteriors, but then they build a set inside, you know, right. and you never see them walking in the door of the cafe. They're just there because, I mean, they walk in from the inside, but you never see them walking in the exterior door because the exterior door is a functioning business and they are shooting the thing in LA and that place is in New York. Right, and those all those scenes where like Jerry and Kramer and George, they're walking down the street. That's on a set, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the same, probably two hundred foot long back lot. Man, it's more. Even, it's probably like a hundred and fifty yards long, but like the same block of fake New York. In and I've been there, like in Universal Studios. There's a back lot that they built for Seinfeld, pretty much, and it's just like a couple blocks of New York that get have been in an uncountable number of famous movies. <laughs> the guy, and it just kind of looks slightly different each time. The, the, the guy who was the soup Nazi owns mm-hmm. a real soup place in New York. <clears throat> and, um, or is, is he the, still I getting just, he's the door inspiration busted? for it. Yeah. Yeah. But he's got, you know, he's got a big billboard up with his face on it, but underneath of it, I've got a picture of it. We'll put it in the show notes underneath of it. He has a uh, stock ticker for like soup man. And I think the <laughs> I think the symbol is soup. What? Wait, what's the stock ticker ticking? He, for his stupid public company, it's like you know, it's like a five cent penny stock. But he's you got a stock, any, baby. Explain, John. Let's have a little episode of how finance works. Um, welcome to uh, this is how finance works. <laughs> John, can you explain? Excuse me, John. Can you explain how a company like that would go public? It's not. It's on the. OTB, like they have these, um, you know, have the main stock. No one knows what the OTB is. Let's take a step back. You have, it's basically, or OTB is actually off track betting. This is OTC, like over the counter, the pink sheets, they call them. It's sort of a mm. lesser, uh, it's a it's lesser. less regulated by the SEC. And there are less regulations. Like to be on the NASDAQ, your stock, I think, has to be like at least a dollar. And it has to have a certain amount of market cap and a certain volume, blah, blah, blah. There's rules. But when you mm-hmm. get down to the pink sheets, there's less regulatory reporting. There's way less volume usually, and the prices are way way smaller because they're not real mm-hmm. companies you know and you right. know if a comp- some companies start out in who's the pink starting sheets, these companies why do they there's got to be hundreds of thousands of them right like why are. are they who, who's going through the trouble of taking these companies public guys like the soup guy you know i mean mm-hmm. you think about it if he gets like a thousand people to buy a couple grand worth of his crappy shares right. he can dump them you know so, the, yeah, so the idea is that you can, because there are pretty strict regulations about raising money for non-publicly traded companies mm-hmm. from non-accredited investors. So the idea is this is sort of a way to raise money from the public without being actual public company. Is right. that kind of the idea? Yeah, and they're not, they're traded on different, um, they're traded on different, like a completely different market. You know, you have like NASDAQ, you have the New York Stock Exchange, you have mm-hmm. the Amex exchanges. None of this stuff is traded on that. It's on a completely separate exchange. You could still buy and sell it relatively easily, but uh, Mm -hmm. they're just basically they're like much less legitimate companies. And occasionally companies from the pink sheets will go over to like NASDAQ usually. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, he's got a he's got a sticker. He's got a ticker, baby. I'm looking. I'll look it up. How how much trading volume you think it's going like how many shares are trading changing hands every none? I don't know. Less than five. I mean, the yeah, ticker must sure. be very boring. It's like, yeah, it's the, been at, it's been at thirty six cents for the last nine weeks. All right, here we go. It's oh, baby, huge day for the soup man. 
Really? Uh, well, what is it? So two days ago they traded. Uh, let's see. It is two tenths of a cent right now. Okay. And it's on the OTC, the over the counter markets, and the symbol is soup Q. John, what if we commit right now? Yeah. On this show, let's yeah. talk about finance and stuff. Or yeah. how, fin- how finance works and stuff, I think is the name of the show. What if we commit to investing 100% of the future profits in perpetuity of let's talk about finance and how it works and stuff Yeah, into Soup C Incorporated? Soup, soup Q, Soup Man? Yeah, I'm let's sorry, do Soup it. Q, yes. Soup Q is the ticker. Uh, dude, it's got a market cap of $600,000. That's tiny. I mean, obviously, in terms of. Why doesn't of... he consolidate some of this stock and make the. <laughs> I don't like, know. you know what I mean? Like, why are there so many shares out there? I don't know. Um, but it doesn't trade much. Yeah, we could, we could definitely move the price here. I mean, a couple hundred bucks and we can move this thing around for sure. But there's um, not going to be any buyers on the other side. I mean,. No, no, no. I'm just saying long-term investment. Like, I just want to just start reinvesting all of the profits from this particular show sure. within the show. Understood. Into Soup Soup Q. Soup Q, yeah. Yeah, Let's what do, do you it. think? Oh, okay. yeah. So, well, you know, ba- he, the guy went bankrupt. He's out of mm. bankruptcy. The company's looking stronger. Wait, 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 wait. But I thought you're not allowed to be an officer in a publicly traded company if you declare bankruptcy. I think the company. I don't know if he personally declared bankruptcy. It looks like Soup oh, Q did, though. Okay, yeah, they, they reorganized. Did. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. They got wow. out of bankruptcy a year ago. A year ago tomorrow, they wow. got out of bankruptcy. Okay, it's mm-hmm. time to go super long. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we're gonna. It looks like we're buying Soup Man. Is there futures trading on OTC stocks? Uh, not futures, but they would have. I don't even know if they have options. To be honest with you. Oh. Never, I you never trade this stuff. I mean, you'd never do. John, it. this is scams. Don't tell me what to here. do, baby. Don't you tell could, me I what to say, do. I never would. I never this is would. the wild west, baby. It's scam. It really is scam city. I mean, John, when I Q, buy us a boat with my Soup Q stock that yeah. I dump and just crash everyone else's fortunes, yeah, you're gonna be real mad, bro. How if many the, of the shares? What percentage of the shares of Soup Q do you think he owns? Uh, we could find out. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it, doesn't matter. it trades so <laughs> thin, like it it hasn't traded for two days. Mm. You know, it's there's no volume mm-hmm. at all. It's trash. Who's here's another question, John. And then mm. we should probably wrap up this episode of this is how finance works and stuff with John Chimp. And um, by the way, everyone is so so should be very drunk right now. Oh, for sure. Uh, they yeah. The rule is while we're on a sidetrack. You have to take <laughs> yeah. a shot every minute that the soundtrack lasts. Oh. So while we're on this, we're going to close this episode of how stuff works with finance and John Schimpf and stuff pretty soon. But in the meantime, John, I want to know who is um, who, who's uh, sort of in charge of actually running the market itself, the the, entire- these OTC markets? Oh, I have no idea. I'm sure there's some regulatory body. Um I would imagine the SEC regulates it. Is that where like an SEC career goes to die? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like Siberia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, they're like, yeah, you're gonna be in the, the the OTC gulag, bruh. Yeah. OTB was a thing. I said OTB earlier accidentally. OTB is off track betting, which mm-hmm. is uh, the ponies. Well, that's what we were talking. About. Well, yeah, that's like what we're talking about with betting on. Uh, we're, we're betting on the hundredth episode. Right. Right, that's OTB, that at, right? You could do that at OTB, I guess. I've never done it before. I, I every time when I was a younger guy, I would go to New York. People would always ask me. I don't know why, but I had I don't know half a dozen, six people ask me, "Where's the OTB?" Hmm. It was a big thing. There were OTB uh, tracks all over the city, and I haven't mm-hmm. seen one in the last couple of years. I'm sure they exist, but I haven't mm-hmm. seen them. Well, they're probably a lot online now, don't you think? Oh, so true. That is so true. Um, all right. Well, this has been. Such a good episode, such a great inaugural episode of How Stuff Works with Finance and John Schimpf explaining it to us stuff, Inc. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. Uh, back to you. I guess we'll do it that way. John, um, so locations, though, I think as everyone's beginning to understand, it's, you know, it's a complicated process, and, and that's part of why with this film I was, I was excited about keeping it pretty contained. You know, I, mm. I, I, I like the idea of really nailing something kind of simple instead of 
you know, spending so much of our time and energy running from place to place. And, and, and back to hunter gather, there were some actually really cool moments. Like, you know, there was this motel that we were shooting in this really dumpy motel. And, um, it is amazing to see production designers and, and everyone that works in that department kind of do their work. It's pretty incredible because they really will, to your point earlier, they will go in and rip up carpet and paint the walls and completely replace all the furniture. And then they shoot there. And then within another 11 hours, you know, you've done all the work. And I mean, this isn't an ideal scenario, but like you've done all the work and boom, it's back to normal. And somehow you would never know that they were even there. That's what a good production designer can do. Now that's another thing. Like people get really mad cause you don't put it back the way it was and you take lots of pictures and it doesn't work out, but it happens a lot. You'd be surprised. Like, even on small movies, you know, it's pretty pretty amazing what people can can pull off. I immediately think of the Simpsons episode where they're going to shoot the the next radioactive man movie in Springfield and they ask mm. the Simpsons if they can film par- a scene in their house and they're going to give mm-hmm. them like $35. <laughs> and uh, they pay the they pay him the 35 uh, bucks and they immediately walk into the house and just start tearing walls out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit how it goes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been fun. I mean, the, the, the other side of this is, I mean, you know, it's not all so glamorous to your point about the Ford focuses earlier, Mm. you know, I've got some sort of harrowing tales of not knowing what I'm doing in locations as well. For instance, for instance, for instance, you know, one of the first big jobs we did at fancy Rhino, we were shooting for Samsung. Okay. And um, which was like huge, 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 huge for us. Um, we're shooting some uh, digital phone commercials that ended up winning a couple awards. It was great. But anyway, we're with our client who is sort of a, an agency that's actually based out here. Um, you know, we're with our client. Thankfully, no one from Samsung is there. But, you know, we, we've got we're shooting kind of a doc style thing, so documentary style. So it's 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 not like a big polished set. You know, we're kind of following a person around and like staging certain things of them using this phone and creating environments. But we I mean, literally the whole crew is there's three of us total camera director kind of lighting. But I don't even know if we really had much lighting. And so we have to film in San Francisco and me being a big dum dum who just started a company for the first time like a year before, I'm just kind of like, yeah, we'll be fine. We'll just shoot in the park, you know? Like, well, nothing could happen. Well, it turns out you need permits, right? not surprisingly, to shoot in the park. I didn't know that. And so I'm like, at the last minute, we get told we can't be there. And we don't have like, a location who? agreement. By like a park person, you know, like a cop. Okay. And I'm just hideously embarrassed in front of the client. It's terrible. You know, it's mm. just absolutely... But, but, but of course it was fine. Anyway, we kind of like sneak around it. The client ended up being cool. Allison, you're the best. If you're listening, you're the best, Allison. You're the best client. Thank you. And she really was. She was like so chill. But it was just horribly embarrassing. And then later, this is kind of the funny part. We end up back in the park. It's, you know, it's very early in the morning. It's like 7 in the morning. We're just kind of getting B-roll. B-roll is uh, B-roll. B-roll is B-roll. Is B-roll. Anyway. <laughs> what is B-roll? Everybody wants to know. B-roll is the stuff that you see if you're watching a documentary. B-roll is not not interviews. You know, it's like other stuff. It's gotcha. action footage. Yeah, there's a better definition out there. I'll link to it in the show notes. That makes perfect anyway, sense, though. But in a narrative, hold up, though. I, there's in no a real docu- B-roll in a narrative. Yeah. Okay, there is not. Well, I don't know. Some people may disagree with that. I don't think of it as B-roll, though. Yeah. Okay, I got you. But um, so anyway. There's all these people doing Tai Chi. It's about 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, and there's all these people doing Tai Chi. Anyway, a couple hundred yards away, Drew, my my business partner, sees a pair of shoes sitting on the ground. Mm. And um, we're like, oh, okay. There's no one around. We look around. The client's there, which was just hilarious. And uh, the client's there, but Drew looks at the shoes, and they're, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a nice – barely worn pair of Cole Hans, you know, mm-hmm. Cole Hans, it's like a pretty nice brand of shoes. Sure. And Drew kind of looks around. He's like, oh, there's no one around. I wonder where these shoes came from. And he kind of smells them. They don't smell too bad. Oh boy. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, we kind of do our thing. We come back like 20 minutes later. The shoes are still there. And Drew's like, ah, I'm taking these shoes. I don't think, I think someone forgot them. So we take them. 
Well, a, a few hours later, of course, once we're gone, it occurs to both of us clearly, without a doubt, those shoes belong to some old Asian man doing chi- Tai Chi in the park. Oh, gee. And Drew totally ganked his shoes. Oh, no. <laughs> but it was too late to take them back. I felt really bad about it. The guy shouldn't have left his shoes like 300 yards away from where he was doing Tai Chi. Oh, but still, that it's kind of like. God. You didn't I go know. back and give him his shoes? We were gone. We were like long gone. There was oh, no were, way to get uh, back. Oh, no. Yeah. I know. Isn't that sad? Drew, sorry to out you, bro. Um, but, you know, stuff like that happens. I'm trying to think. Funnest location ever. We got to go to Hawaii for an entire week. Whoa. And just putts around the island with these really wealthy people who. They're just the coolest people ever. Um, they inherited kind of Kathy, the the wife. The, you know, they're probably in their 60s. Um, her dad was a big liquor importer and kind of basically invented, created Jägermeister, started – or no, he was the first group to, like, import and figure out how to kind of market Jägermeister, which, as you can imagine, is huge. They started Grey Goose, sold that for a bajillion dollars. Anyway, but they're philanthropists. That's their whole thing, and – they brought us to Hawaii to basically make some videos about some of the work that different people that they were supporting were doing. And it was the coolest thing ever because we're just hanging out with musicians and like, you know, touring around at these nature preserves in Hawaii and staying at their second house that was like overlooking this incredible beach vista and just crushing a week in Hawaii. That was probably the coolest location. I've I think ever the thing that at. would be the most satisfying about that trip uh, is knowing that it was paid for by the suffering of millions and millions of alcoholics. <laughs> I went to the I went to the Met Thanks recently, and they have trip. you know wherever you go in the Met in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they have mm-hmm. uh, you know this this wing was paid for by so and so, and <clears throat> some of my favorite parts of that museum are are paid for by the Sackler family. Mm-hmm. It sounds is, familiar. It, it it should because they're they're the family that runs Park Purdue Medical and are responsible for oxycotton. Jeez. Oh, so they had just sort of somebody sort of outed them. I don't know how I had never heard about these people before, but somebody outed these people, and I happened to be in New York at the time in the Met, and just you walk around everywhere, and their name is just on absolutely everything. Yikes! Them and the Koch brothers—they're all over Ugh. the Met. I guess I'm not going to the Met anymore. You know, it's sad because it's a, it, to me that's like to me to me that's a little bit like the lottery. You know, right? Maybe maybe don't sell lottery tickets to people in poverty and then claim that you're going to use the money that you just stole from them by education, baby, on on their shitty education. You know, oh, yeah. maybe just don't. Maybe just figure out a better way to do that. It's a you know? it's crazy. Instead of here. creating addictions where people are spending their last five dollars on lottery tickets because they're convinced that that's their one way out of poverty. That's they, messed up. They have a scholarship here. I think it's called the Hope Scholarship or something like that. And it's uh, basically to give middle class white kids lottery ticket money to go to college. Mm. It's a wealth transfer from the poorest in the in the state to the middleest in the state. Wow. That sounds like function functioning economy and, and sort of social services to me. I had, I sort of, we're too liberal, John. We need to, it's not that we're too liberal. We, we, (laughs) you're not even very liberal. You're kind of, how would you peg yourself? Uh, I'm just kind of of a hands off guy, right? Well, I'm more just like all over the map. You know, I just, Mm -hmm. I agree with whoever, you know, I'm not ideological and I'm not left or right. It's crazy. Yeah, that's kind of that's how I feel. I I I just hope people don't get too turned off by our my, my, my usually my ranting. But I would who I would love to hear the guy who's like the lottery's fine. Who cares about the poor? <laughs> like who's getting mad about that? No, it's true. You know where I, I would not complain about the lottery though if they would give it to independent movies. Ah, well, that's what give the tax. It, they, don't they have all kinds of tax uh, breaks for you guys out there? Tax breaks are actually interesting yeah they they usually um i mean doesn't well, that factor in huge with location because you're obviously does, not actually. going up to vancouver yeah that's actually a really good question yeah i'm not going to vancouver so most states that have tax breaks some of the most famous ones uh georgia actually just down the yeah. road from you atlanta is a baby. huge one they're filming all sorts of movies in atlanta they filmed infinity wars there 
Yeah, totally. Um, there's massive studios. They do a lot of location work. Atlanta is also kind of a bland downtown in Yo, some Atlanta ways. So they can so kind of... sick. I love Atlanta. Just for the record. No, no, no. No, I, no, I know you're yeah. not saying it's not, but just for the listeners out there, if you haven't, go to Hot Atlanta. It's the sickest. I love it. It is pretty fun. It's fun. But um, there's great food, you know, good, you know, if you want to go dancing, plenty of places for that. People are nice. It's totally safe. It's a great town. Cook Cola Museum. Yep. But... Atlanta, yeah, so Georgia does about a 30% tax credit, which is – so there, I'm not going to try to get into all of it. Well, Maybe we'll have an expert on one day because it's actually kind of interesting, but I, I'm i not as studied up as I would need to be. But there's sort of rebates and credits, and it's all tax stuff, but there are some that are really hard to get. There's some that the state puts a cap on it, and so you know they only give away $20 million every year, and then there's some that – you have to go through a bajillion logistical and legal hoops to get the money, and then there are others that are really easy, and so all of that factors in. But the baseline numbers, there are a handful of states that are around 30%, which the other thing, too, is can you use it on above-the-line talent, above-the-line versus below-the-line? Above-the-line is like directors, producers, and cast is the best way to think about that. And then, quote-unquote, below-the-line is basically everyone who actually makes everything. And so, you know, usually below the line is always covered. But, for instance, in an Infinity War, you know, with that many actors, a massive part of the budget is going to be paying actors like Jeremy Renner and Chris uh, Hemsworth and Scarlett Johansson and Robert Downey Jr. and all those people a butt ton of money. And I don't know for sure if Atlanta allows you to deduct, you know, to add their stuff, but... If they do, that would make sense why people are doing it there. But basically what that means is, let's say you make a $100 million movie with qualified expenses, you know, $100 million of qualified expenses. If you handle it all right, you can get back $30 million from the government based on the fact that you created economic stimulus and brought jobs and rented out hotel rooms and paid caterers and what? hired people and all that kind of stuff yep it's it's huge and the the states that do a good job at it i think atlanta the budget's kind of balancing itself because they're creating an entire film economy you know there's and 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 these jobs are really well paying i mean part of the reason people like atlanta is because it's a right to work state um and so the unions have less control but still i mean these are good paying jobs you know if you're working as a grip um you're getting paid real money and you don't have to go to college for it sure um, so yeah, Georgia's an interesting place. There are other places, um, you know, LA, I forget LA's status about tax credits. Basically the reason I'm not going to an Atlanta or to a Vancouver or whatever is because most of these States, they're all different, but most of them have what's called a floor where if you don't spend a certain percentage, if you don't I spend see. a certain budget, you don't qualify. Right. And I think in a lot of States I might qualify, but the actual, hoops that I would have to jump through and all that kind of stuff starts to not be real worth it, you know? That seems this budget absolutely level. crazy to me that you can get up to 30-something percent back. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, especially because a lot of states, like I think New Orleans is this way, you have to run everything through a local company, and you have to... Mm-hmm. Be, and you can only pay that to people who are residents of Louisiana. Right. And so that's how they keep the money in the system. And they're like, yeah, that's great. You can bring in Scarlett Johansson, but you're not going to be able to get 30% back on her $12 million salary. Sure. Because she doesn't live here. She's not adding to the economy. But there are, I think, some states that are pretty forgiving about that kind of stuff. I think California has like a an under a million or under $2 million indie category credit you know fund basically that you can apply for but it's very difficult to get because as you can imagine there's a million movies getting made and i think they it, it's it's different you know and then in europe it's, it's its own thing you can there are arts grants and so i you know i met some people recently that were making a movie in like i don't know hungary or something and it's kind of nuts because there's not really a market which is why they have to subsidize it but they want the arts to be made which i think is great and so the government will be like hey this is a really cool project here's you know similar the way we do with like certain scientific projects and things they're like here's a million dollars go raise the other two hundred thousand you know from uh from private investors and things like that but this is non-recoupable you know like this is just a grant you just get to have it um there are other tax credits this is uh, gosh this is probably so boring but 
Um, there are other tax credits that are transferable. There are some that are non-transferable, which means that you don't actually get a cash rebate. You just get a tax break. You know, I think that's typically, I get my terminology confused, but that's typically what considered a rebate where basically it counts against what you owe. And so it reduces your liability. And so what you can do is there's this whole secondary market in film where first of all, you can borrow against tax credits. And Mm. so you can, if you are an established company, you can get a bond that basically says, if you finish the movie, you will be owed $12.5 $12.5 million by the state of Georgia, and we will loan you that cash because you don't get it until the end. We'll loan you 75% of that cash with a 12% fee, and then you pay. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tax credit funding is a whole thing, and, and we've actually, you know, we've actually done we've I've actually had conversations about trying to raise money to basically fund tax credits where it's kind of the same thing where you basically are just fronting that based on a contract and then there's also transferable there's a secondary market there's these specialized banks that basically connect and they did do these with all sorts of industries but you can basically sell transferable tax credits to people with a larger tax liability um so if you don't get the actual cash, you're like, well, I don't need a $20 million tax credit because I don't have a $20 million tax liability. You then sell that at a discounted rate to someone who does have a $20 million tax sure. liability. Anyway, I think we buy pretty boring Suit stuff, Q. but this is kind of how movies get made, you know? Well, it, no, it's absolutely fascinating. I'll tell you, there's a couple things that pop out of my head. One, how has there not been, or maybe there has been, a race to the bottom, right? Like, so if Georgia, mm-hmm. which. Oh, yeah. 10 years ago had no or very, very little movie stuff going on now has a ton of it. Tennessee, you know, two hours, two hours away. Tennessee has a tax credit too. But you would imagine that if Georgia's given out 30%, Hey, we'll give out 50 because that's an Mm -hmm. insane amount of money. Um, that actually, that's a good question. It kind of has happened a little bit. Um, certain states of Maryland, for instance, used to have a great tax credit, really, really right. positive. And so Veep was, for, uh, th- there's been a lot of stuff there, but Veep is one example. The governor, uh, you know, a slightly more conservative governor came in. He was like, we're just throwing money down the tubes, got rid of it, and Veep left. And a lot of people were ticked, and then a lot of people were like, you know, well, we weren't making money anyway. I right. tend to think that the tax credit thing makes a lot of sense. I do think it needs to be measured um new orleans had a big thing they lost a ton of production they're trying to get it back but yeah you're right there are a lot of smaller states i think idaho has a great tax credit kentucky ohio they all have great tax credits and people are shooting there the problem is you're right like it's not just a tax credit the only way to attract someone away from say georgia is to basically have a higher tax credit or to make it way easier to get it you know, which yeah. then costs you money. Right. But then the problem is you also have to be able to supply labor or if you're going to force everyone to ship the labor in, then you have to give them a discount on the non-local labor. And like it just starts to get complicated. And I think a lot of governors and other folks, state legislators do kind of make that argument like what are we just going to like start throwing money at people and drive up this giant deficit just so that we can get some decent jobs which don't actually stay local. The good thing about Atlanta is they've been doing it long enough that um the, it's it actually is creating local labor like there actually are training programs and they actually are creating an economy whereas a lot of other places that i've heard of um people ship them in canada actually is one of the best places to shoot europe is also great but canada is amazing vancouver you know you mentioned that earlier all over canada is amazing part of what works for them and part of the reason they can offer such great stuff is they offer in a lot of cases you know the different stuff what are they called provinces states mm, mm. what does canada have yeah they got provinces yeah provinces they're all a little different um some of them though will have a tiered system where you get x percent for out of out of country folks who come in and it's not a ton and then you get a different percentage i do think new orleans is kind of the same way you get a different percentage for local expenditures so anything that like actually stays in the local economy so and then they have certain regulations about like how many people on the cast and crew and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you're really incentivized to hire local, which in that case, it does make a ton of sense. Um, but yeah, it just depends. I mean, again, I'm kind of flying under a lot of that radar intentionally, you know, because it just starts to, it just starts to get bloated and, and at a certain point it starts to make a ton of sense. But for me, I'm kind of like, you know, everybody's working for next to nothing. 
Um, I mean, they're getting paid, you know, obviously minimum wage plus some, but like, it's just not what they're used to. And it's long, long days. And, you know, we're just kind of doing our own thing. Mm. Um, you know, Ted Turner is a huge reason for the, mm. all the mm-hmm. film crap in Atlanta and CNN, he, right. CNN. Well, I'm trying to think of all of his, uh, TBS cartoon network. Time What's kind of his War- time Warner, all that crap. Um, wow. I always forget about time Warner. That's so crazy. And, um, he went to school. He went to high school about a five minute walk from where I'm sitting right now. Really? He Which high school? school? He went to Macaulay and he gave him like a Whoa. million, a crazy amount, like many, many tens of millions of dollars recently. He's also the largest private landowner in the country. He owns like hundreds of thousands of acres and Whoa. he owns uh, steakhouses in Atlanta called Ted's. How is the steak? I don't know. I've never been. Yeah, me neither. It's got a picture of a giant bison on it. I think it's like mm. a they they do a lot of bison, which is gross. Is it? I'm not a fan. Have you had it? I had a, uh, a bison burger ago. in New York. It was trash. Oh boy, was it dry, gamey? It was. Yeah, it's crazy gamey. Mm. And it was one of those giant, like uh, you know, sort of show burgers. It was like a four and a half pound burger. That one of those ridiculous things. Do you think, um, hey, Dan, if you're listening, Dan the Peacock Man, Dan, do you know anybody raising bison? Cause, well, for uh, sure, Ted Turner, dude. He's raising them. Well, all right, we need to find a Ted Turner connect because I kind of want to try some bison. Oh, you can get it anyway. See how it, see how it stacks up. Oh, go to a But I want shop. good bison. Yeah, I, want, I want like a, I want to know that I'm actually getting the real bison experience, the one that keeps people growing them, you know, and raising them and slaughtering them. Um, dude, Ted Turner has a 590,000 acre buffalo ranch. Whoa. It's called That's Verm- so big. <laughs> 590 acres. 590,000 acres, I'm sorry. Can you convert that to square miles for me real quick, John? No, but I can uh, convert it to hectares. It's uh, 293. I don't, I don't know how much a hectare is, bro. Uh, me either. Uh, but it's called Vermejo Park. Vermejo Where Park, is right? it? It's in um, northeastern New Mexico and southern Colorado. Ooh, whoa, it's about three bro. quarters of the state of Rhode Island. Oh my gosh, dude, that's nine hundred and twenty-one square miles. That's nuts. It's well, good so for you, many Ted. Miles, Teddy boy, we just love our Teds. Teddy Bronson, Teddy lives on about a half an acre. Teddy, good luck mowing the grass. I heard it's been real rainy up there. Mm. Um, well, John, what else do we need to cover? Is your location, have your location desires been met? They have been, um, but I think it's going to have to be an ongoing conversation because this is, uh, it's an ongoing thing. When do you find out about the current mystery Masonic temple? Well, that's the thing. I won't really for a while, you know, because Mm. I got to get dates and that, that requires, I, I can't really have dates until I have talent. You know, and I'm waiting for the talent and then um but I'm 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 working with my buddy Brandon. Um he's a super helpful dude and I you know, he's gonna start talking to me about some other places and we're just gonna start spreading out and you know, just kinda come up with a dope list. I, I've actually I'm very feeling very encouraged because I've found maybe three or four other places that each are very different in mm. in in terms of how they feel, but all of them feel like they could work. And so that's really encouraging because it, it's making me feel like, you know, we're going to find something. Yeah. Um, and that's a good feeling. Mm. You know, not anyway. to go, not to go back to this, but I'm, I, there's some guy out there who's taken 16 shots and he needs a 17th. So here it mm-hmm. is. Uh, you yeah. know, speaking of Ted Turner, that he's had a, he had a feud with uh, the Fox news guy, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. Right. In way back in the day, because their yachts collided. How the heck does that happen? <laughs> I don't know. But Why is Ted it was a parking it was like his yacht American right Cup. next to... That's insane. Yeah. Apparently, that was the genesis of the two of them hating each other. You know, they yeah, own opposing or, networks, CNN, Fox, yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. still, right. they're, the, yeah, that's, the, that's the rumor that they, they started a feud after their yachts collided. Wow. What there a waste. Is. There it Maybe is. Just, you know, what, what, what do you think uh, Macaulay thinks about you know, HBO's adult content. Does he have any part of that? Is an HBO part of Time Warner? Uh, I don't know. It's a great question. Yeah, I think it is. Is it? I think it is. Yep. 
Well, it's Time Warner 2 merged with uh, Turner. So originally it's just Turner Broadcasting, which was mm-hmm. all the Atlanta stuff, and then they merged with Time Warner. But he's in charge. I think he's in charge of all of that now. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, they do CNN, and this is a pretty conservative area. That's true, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't spend any time there. Anybody I've ever known that I brought it up to, I don't even think they really knew or cared that he went to school there, aside from yeah, the fact that he gave him a sure ton of money. I'm sure it doesn't really matter. They couldn't care less, because I think Bob Corker went there too, didn't he? Bobby. Bobby. I don't know. Bobby? Bob. I think he's probably listening. Hey, My Bobby, let partner. us know. We, we want to know where you went to school. My life partner has done uh, yoga with, with uh, Senator Bob. Ooh, that's he, kind of a fun fact. Yeah, I've met him a couple times. You know, when I say met, it's like we said two and a half sentences to each yeah, other. Yeah, that's about that's about how far I've gotten with him as well. Yeah, but it's cool. He's a cool guy. Yeah, he's nice. What was the yoga experience like? Uh, well, you know, he's a tiny guy. He's a really, really mm-hmm. short guy. He's but very he's short. A, he's super friendly. And they had a couple conversations. They, my life partner and my kids ran into him on the street around Christmas time last year too. And mm-hmm. he came to their school recently to dish Ooh. on uh, all the happenings. Wow, I want to. I want to just imagine your, your life partner. You know, she's she's there doing downward dog. Right. Bobby's shorts. You know, he he goes into a headstand. His shorts kind of fall up. Right. And she's like, she's like, hey Bob, um, you're. Do, do you mind? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, something yeah, like that. It'd be like, hey, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And she's. I mean, it's a j- j- real accident. You know, it's not like he's being creepy or anything. Sure. Um, I hope that didn't happen. It but would it might be have... really hard to say something to him, wouldn't it? A guy like that? Uh, yeah, perhaps. You know, I saw... Uh... Oh, actually, you know what? We didn't do the mail. There wasn't really oh. any good mail. There was there was one note from uh, Archie. Okay. Archie of Florida. Archie said um, he asked if I ever run into famous people because mm. I've mentioned that a couple times. Mm-hmm. Archie, not too, too often. Um, I did see Zach Galifianakis on the street recently. What do you I do? Did, did not you stop him and him. say anything to him? Nope, didn't say anything. I met Samuel Jackson one time. No, that was Chattanooga cool. native, baby. I know, and that's what we talked about. Um, uh I was really? like, hey, yeah, I was like, you're from Chattanooga, right? And he was like, I am. He's, I was like, yeah, so am I. And he was shocked because we kind of met at like an industry event, you know? And so I don't think he was expecting that to be my next follow-up it was right. pretty interesting we talked for like a minute and then you know the the speaker started going again and i had to go back to my he's seat, he has said publicly some very disparaging things about this city uh, i don't find that surprising no but he lived here you know in this i guess the 70s probably oh, i can't imagine how awful it was was back then. yeah i think his i mean it's pretty darn segregated just... and frustrating now i right. can't imagine back then yeah it would have been a nightmare yeah, but so I met him, and then the, the reason I thought of this, I've got a few other fun ones that I'll pepper in, Ooh. you know, throughout. But um, th- they're really not that great, though. That's why I'm not like dominating the end of the episode with them. But I did one time. I was on a trip, a, a work trip with my dad. We had a day to kill. We were shooting some video, and we were like, that we were staying at this hotel that the client put us up in, and we were like, you know, there's a there's a, a spa downstairs. Maybe we should go get massages. So we did. It was great. We did. We got massages, and then who should I run into in the locker room or whatever you call that? But uh, Alec Baldwin's brother. <laughs> oh, that's, so that's happened to so many people. They think it's Alec, Alec Baldwin's and... brother, Stephen. And uh, I saw I saw his yuhu, his winky. Nuh uh Yeah, I saw him naked. In it, and then and it was uh, it was okay. It was I wouldn't seek out the opportunity again. Right, but we did not really exchange words. Man, we was just, it manicured? Just, uh, no, just normal. Huh? Normal, un unscaped. How did he look naked? I mean, aside from his dingling, is he in good shape? I I don't even know what he looks mm, like. Nah, he's just he's like a dude in his you know early sixties, just kind of like a guy. I don't know how old he is, but you know he's just like a he's just a guy. Let's find out how old he is. He he, he he didn't have like a big belly or anything, but he also certainly was not cut. Um, yeah. I went to a local not YMCA. like me. <laughs> like I went to a local oh, like boy. pool, you know, rec- like uh, in the last couple of years. And I oh, he's fifty. That's not that bad. bad. I no, ran no. into a college professor of mine, and me and my kids are showering and. 
you know, it's just so awkward because he strips mm-hmm. down completely naked. I guess me and the boys at this point are like drying off. You know, we're getting we're out of there. So mm-hmm. we're covered up. But, you know, he's in the middle of talking to us and he's just like dropping trout. It's so awkward. Yeah. It's just the sure. worst. Yeah. No, it's not the best. Mm-mm. I don't know if it's the worst, but it's certainly not the best. It's not great. There are worse things that could happen, but, you know, mm-hmm. come on. You don't want to see yeah. older people that you know naked. You just don't. No. Yeah. I know. I realized at some point that I was going to the same gym as my therapist. Uh-oh. And um, we just, we, 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 we didn't even talk about it. We just, uh, we, we exchanged a glance and just kind of were like, we're not going to talk. Right. And he was like, yeah, that, that we said that with our eyes and, right. and it was okay. You know, we just kind of avoided each other. It was fine. Did, yeah. That's so awkward when you see somebody out of place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ran into, I used to work at this little small business here in town. It's that is actually the place I met Bob Corker. And I, it was mm. during the Obamacare debates and I asked him a question about it. Mm-hmm. And I was being sort of obsequious to him, so I sort of indicated, like, I'm with you on this, mm-hmm. you know. And he, he shut me down and said something very positive about our political process in America in general. Mm. Uh, but I ran into a per- somebody that How did that make you feel? It was I was actually heartened by it. His response mm-hmm. was really – I just said something sort of flippant, like, this is so crazy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, nothing – really that deep yeah, yeah, yeah or I get whatever you. but i was just sort of indicating because he's on the side that thinks this is crazy you know yes. so i said something like this is crazy isn't it and he's like wow you know how he talks about bob, bob corker he said well, something like wow a lot of people need health insurance or something like that and it's like the process is working <laughs> itself out i was like all right man sick moving on uh but i saw a, a lady that i used to work for this is like 10 years ago you know and it's like I just it's so awkward i don't mm-hmm. you know you knew me a long time ago and there's nothing like embarrassing or bad that she knows about me but it's just like i don't know man we don't have anything to talk about but we used to spend you know for a year we spent every day together mm-hmm. that's one thing that occurred to me recently about the film industry is a lot of people will leave but the the pool is only going to get smaller how so you know like the well it's already a very, very, very small industry mm. in terms of people who are working professionals. There's just not a lot of jobs, especially in like the writing, directing, producing world. There's just not a lot. And so, and then it gets harder the bigger the projects get. There's fewer and fewer people actually making stuff mm. the, the bigger the projects get. And so eventually, if you last, you will have probably been at it for 30 plus years and there will only be so many people who have also made it for 30 plus years, you know? Right, right, right. And so by the end, you think about like, and, and, and what happens is you go to these festivals, you go to award shows, and if you're like really crushing it, you know, in one year, that's how I actually know some people is going to like award shows. Like you go to like a brunch and then you go to the actual thing and then you go to the after party and then you go to another one three weeks later and you see the same people. And so if you're like Meryl Streep and you're at the Oscars every year, that also means you're at every event leading up to the Oscars and you're at the Golden Globes and you're at all the other events and they get you just end up seeing the same people. And you do that for 30 years consecutively. There's only so many people who have lasted that long and you just kind of like will be seeing the same people for a very long time. Sure. Which isn't necessarily the case if you work in like a normal giant corporation, you know? Yeah, and a lot of, it's sort of not incestuous. That's too strong of a word, but a lot of these people No, it's insular. It is insular, much better word, yeah. And that's part of the reason it's hard to get things done. Do you, you feel know? like an outsider? Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, for, I'm definitely an outsider. I've been poking and prodding at this I'm okay with that, but I'm very much an outsider. Yeah, I've been poking this like this point a little bit just out of curiosity, but um I asked you before if anybody away. said anything to you about like this business, this town, and I wonder if anybody has given you the. I asked you this exact question before: Has anybody given you the business? But have people? Do people go out of their way? Certain people go out of their way to make you feel like an outsider. Big dog. Mm. Have you ever been big dogged? Yeah, I've been big dogged. I, I'm trying to think of a really specific, concise example, and I'm having trouble thinking of one. I mean, because the thing is, is most people are, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's an example. There was an agent at an unnamed... Uh, there's an agent at an unnamed agency, a big one, one of the f- big ones. And we had a couple conversations. Um, the Central I came, Intelligence Agency. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one of the ones that you don't know about. National Security um, <laughs> Are you listening, NSA? Do you think they're still listening, or do we bore them off? That's the, t- that's the tactic. I don't want to get caught on the sidetrack, but take a drink if you realize that the fact that every phone call being recorded forever makes it possible to go back in time in the future and blackmail people retroactively. Mm. A senator, a guy who's going to become a senator in that's 50 That's basically years, what Facebook is. Yeah, well, exactly. It's hard to use like that publicly, but all the private stuff that you don't want to know about, Anthony Weiner, are you listening Ooh, the- ooh, ooh. Did you hear about John? Did you hear about um, which is it? National Enquirer. There's a vault. Yeah, with yeah, blackmail yeah. materials. Oh, for sure. Well, dude, how crazy is that? You're telling me that some guy. Let, this has happened. For instance, this a guy who works at the National Security Operation Agency. Midnight Climax, bro. We, we did talk about this. The guy who works at the NSA got a guy who works at the National Security Agency got busted recently because he was spying on his like girlfriend or spouse or mm. whatever. He was using all the stuff that what's his nuts who's in Russia right now, Snowden. Mm. Snowden, yeah. All the stuff that he talked about. These boneheads were used into like or a bonehead, presumably many many more would are or would do this, using it to spy on people in America that they know. And wow. you're going to tell me that, like, if you have access, if I were sitting there or somebody like me is sitting in an office and they potentially have access to every single American's text messages, emails, dot, 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 fill in the blank. How are you not going to look at that? Mm-hmm. How are you not? Yeah. No, that's It's a freaky. blackmail machine. Mm-hmm. And they're recording no, totally calls is. right now. Like, if, a, if I decide to run for Congress in 20 years, all of the... Th- Every online thing I've ever done, text message, email, phone call, everything, can be used against me in the future. I wonder how many kajilowatts of electricity are you storing all of that information? There's a big data center out in Utah that has been built for this exact... The one on the mountain? For this, I don't know, but it's built for this exact purpose. So crazy. Um... Man, what a glug, wild concept. Glug, glug, glug. Keep on drinking, folks. John, Here we go. Maybe don't get us off track. So One bad. final thing I want to just say to. to oh, boy. To Here the, we go. Another off track. The, <laughs> Good thing people have had a few days to sober up. Uh, uh, speaking of sobering up, it's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, what, just today or last night, I guess, um, are America's most famous non American inventor, Elon Musk. Oh. Um. Yeah, what about him? He got in a little. He got in a little trouble. Did you see this? You did. Uh, you must have seen it. Oh, 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 oh! With the stock, yeah, yeah. yeah. But tell people, tell people. So t- Elon Musk, uh, who I, I think is a cool guy. I think he's a fascinating guy. Uh, I'm skeptical of the company. I think he's fascinating. I don't know if I would call him cool. You don't I don't know if I cool? would like want to be his. Well, I don't, I wouldn't want to like be his best friend. Oh, really? I think he'd be really fun to talk to. No, 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 no. He would be a fun friend to have. I just don't know that I would count on him in like a deep way, you know? Yeah, he's well, he's all over the map. And that's that's what I'm saying. Sort of what's going on with him. He went on uh, a podcast, Joe Rogan's podcast, and he smoked the little ganja with him. Uh, oh, with Joe. With Joe Rogan, yeah. He smoked I got to listen him. to this episode. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's kind of a mediocre episode. It's cool if you like Elon. I enjoyed it, but yeah, it was kind of a flat episode cuz he's a weirdo. Oh, really? He's a robotic, dude. He's weird. Do you think that episode of Rogan is going to beat this episode in terms of downloads. <laughs> I think the amount of downloads that they got in the time it took me to say downloads is more than we'll ever have. Uh, I wish I was able to disagree with you in good conscience, but I just don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> but the, <laughs> Like so many downloads. It's just bizarre, bizarro world because as soon as I saw uh, that Musk was going on that show and I saw it because Joe Rogan posted an Instagram picture of Musk smoking weed mm. on his show. So I immediately flipped over to the like financial news and 
Tesla stock was tanking, not tanking, but, of you course, know, like eight, nine it's percent. Dropping. That's uh, a lot. <clears throat> it was at the time. It's like six and a half now, but down six and a half percent. Not, not nothing crazy, but all of the headlines, like CNBC, Fox Business, all this stuff was just Elon Musk smokes weed. Oh my god! You got to figure billions of dollars, right? I mean, if you, if it goes down ten percent, that's like five billion dollars. It's insane. Depending when that happens. Five billion bucks because this guy smoked a joint. Oh, my gosh. Now, there was more news on the day. Like, right after that, the CFO immediately quit and the HR, the head of HR quit. <laughs> quit. Yeah. Not necessarily because of the interview, but... Um, I'm, uh... Yeah, I'm 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 just waiting. I, I I'm gonna do a quick Google search for uh, Elon Musk class action lawsuit because I actually own like a couple of sort of novelty shares of yeah. te- Tesla, and uh, th- I'm a little annoyed to be honest. Yeah, well, you'll get the mail. You'll get the mail. Yeah, I'm joining. I want my ten dollars. Yeah, that you know that is a not, I wouldn't say scam, but um, we might have to have Uncle the lawyers Nate. make out the best. The lawyers sure. make so much money. Yep, and for sure. Anything that happens, there's always a suit, and it's really just to pad the lawyers' pockets. You're not going to see a dime. I think back in the no. day, you know, if you have a couple shares or something or whatever, and you join one of these class actions, basically all you have to do is sign your name on some stupid form, and they'll send you like twelve sure. bucks. Yeah. It's your cut, no, and the lawyers get, like, you know, yeah, tens insane. of millions. Cool. John, well, uh, this has been a delightful part two. Indeed. I'm excited to what, – what, what are we going to talk about next week? I mean, the world is our oyster, baby. Yeah. We do, we do need to talk, and we need to talk about rollers. Oh, maybe we should talk about rollers next week. I think we need a rollers update. Oh, Because okay. you're in well, the middle of casting, mm-hmm. right? You're in the mm-hmm. middle of location hunting. We talked about that. John, that's that. such a good idea. I never would have thought of that, so I'm so glad <laughs> that you did. <laughs> I know. I'm going to bring it back. We're going to talk about rollers for sure. I, you know, John, one thing we haven't talked about a lot. You have not yet read the script. I have not. Because I have not sent it to you. No, but I and have I think we should my have own a version of it. <laughs> we'll <laughs> talk about I that later. I have read because I'm a good friend. <laughs> You've read I've read the version that you ripped off mm. based on the log line. Um, no, but I, I want to talk about a the, the should should you read the script, right? Because that's a conversation, and then b you know we'll just talk about the development process. We'll talk about how a script gets written. I mean, I think there's a lot of meat there. I think it's going to probably end up being uh, strewn out over you know the the coming many months that we talk about development but in some ways i think you know just kind of kicking that topic off would be a great way to to spend next week what do you think yeah i think it's a great idea and i do know just to build it up because you've taken screenwriting classes you wrote this script you've written Mm -hmm. things before so this is not you know some kid in his basement cranking out something is it no it's some kid in his apartment cranking out something. <laughs> no i mean it's 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 clearly i'm not gonna i don't know if i'm the best judge i i read a lot of scripts i've written a lot of stuff i think it's good and i think um that's been confirmed by people who are signing their names onto the project you know mm. like professionals professionals who read a lot of stuff like rebecca and greta and all these other people who are involved with the projects who have great taste and think it's good. So that's been really encouraging. And I think, um, and yeah, I, we'll, we'll get into it next week. Yeah, we'll I'm get into it. it. And I, you know, I want to yeah. tease it just it's a, a little bit coming. more by saying, I want to know how you can tell in Hollywood, the land of fakes and phonies, how, how you can actually tell if somebody likes something. But we're not even going to talk about it right now. We're not even going to discuss mm-hmm. it. Yeah. We're going we're to gonna save that for next week. Okay, cool. Talk well, this has been fun. We'll talk soon. All right. Okay, thanks for tuning in for episode 12 of I Guess We'll Do It That Way. Join us next week when we talk about the development process and whether or not John should read the script for Rollers. Also, don't forget to send in your address if you're a winner of one of the coveted t-shirts. And no cheating. Today's show was produced and edited by Isaiah Smallman, executive producer John Shimp. Outro music is Man From Nowhere by Tom Paulus and Max Bells. Our cover art was designed by Nate Giordano. This has been a production of Mama Bear Studios. Feeling the heat of the desert air The rambling journey is all I know It's your boy